When I set out to make these videos, I wanted to go to interesting places. And the Botanical Conservatory at UC Davis is certainly that. And today, I'm very grateful to share with all of you my time there with Ernesto Sandoval. He is both the director and curator of the conservatory on campus. He and his amazing team of students opened the doors so that we could show you guys a little bit of what they've been working on. And I wanna thank Ernesto and Gianluca for taking time out of their busy schedules to show Kevin and I around. And also thank everybody watching. It's been really great to meet so many of you fellow questers at recent events. And uh, thank you for subscribing and really, really appreciate you guys being here. I now present to you Ernesto Sandoval at the UC Davis Botanical Conservatory. Enjoy. Okay, so you're gonna show us the desert room here. Yeah, yeah, right, come on in here. All right, so what I wanna show you a couple things that we're propagating. One, um, we've been pollinating our dendrosicchios. This plant has sometimes have, has a, um, a female flowers, but it, it's oftentimes more, it sort of tends towards more towards male. Right. I'll take you over and I'll show you the female here in a second. So I heard this is the but, smaller of the two that you have. Uh, no, you know, actually, this is the largest of the, uh, the cucumber trees, the dendrosicchios. It's the biggest one I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. So, and this is the old, this is probably the original seedling that we've had for, uh, since I think 1969, <laughs> something awesome. like that. Um, and it actually has been kind of tortured. Yeah. So um, we actually grow, grow them much faster now because we've realized that with a lot of these leafy desert plants, if you water them, they grow. Yeah. Shocking. Yeah, it's like, it's like a magic trick. <laughs> yeah, really. yeah. It's, you know, because these things make leaves when, it, when, it's, when it's, there's water and drop them when it's dry. And so in cultivation, if you keep them moist more than in, in the wild, they grow much faster. And is this okay. something that you're propagating primarily from seed, or would you also be propagating this from cutting? Only from seed. Only from Dendrosicios seed. Dendrosicios doesn't do, people haven't had any success uh, rooting them from cuttings. Gotcha. What's, so what's the issue seed. with rooting them from cuttings? You know, um, it's probably an issue of rot. Just like uh, fungus Some pathogen and... fungus gets in there, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. There's just some things that, you know, just don't work well like that. Another example is Wellwichia over here. Right. This is actually a female. Uh, she made some cones earlier this year, but uh, she had some po complications from, from uh, desiccation. Right. Uh, and so she, we lost the, the batch of cones. You can see a bunch of them forming right here. Yeah. So I'm going to have a lot coming up pretty and soon. And it seems like you've had a lot. I mean, you can see all oh. the holes mm -hmm. from the previous. These previous are the ones seasons. that I, these are, these are the ones that I, that, that I lost. I, I, was, I was gone for a while and the plant didn't get watered enough so that it aborted the cones. Um, so you have all the leaflets or the little the little wings, but no seed. In yeah, them. exactly. It, you know, it was it just it, they just didn't finish maturing. Okay. Um, but so that's a f one of our females. This is one of our males here. So I've been um, this is the last batch of, 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 of male cones that I harvested the pollen from. Awesome. And I'll show you the female in a second. OK, so we've been pollinating this because, you know, people out there uh, really want it. And part of w our main job here at the conservatory is to grow plants for teaching purposes here on campus right okay teaching research and then uh, um, sort of public support well outreach is the other big arm of the university right and so the way we d we consider one of the ways that we do outreach is by growing plants that are hard to get and putting them out there gotcha um, and so we propagate you know well which yeah so and, and with certain plants well which not so much but with some plants by getting that plant material out there for the rare plants you're also sort of just relieving a little pressure off the habitats exactly which yeah, yeah have a lot of mm -hmm. pressure on yeah them at the moment. yeah I mean you know truth be told not too many people are going to make it over to Socatra. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, to to harvest more uh, more seed of this plant. Um, so uh, we're one of the main producers of, of seedling of, of seed of this plant. That's There's beautiful. other people in the world that have them now, but uh, for a while we were the first ones that were producing seed of that. Plant. So it's 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 uh, pretty likely that any of the ones I've seen in collections in Southern California originated right here. Exactly. That's very yeah. cool. They're they're progeny from from this plant, and it's a, it's. It is, it, it, you know, right now it only has male, male flowers, but it is a male-female plant. Yeah. It has male-female flowers like most cucurbits. Um, well, some, uh, many of them. And so it, it, it has been selfed and made babies of it. Yeah. So I'm going to bring you over here and show you our, our, our um, uh, female well, witcher that's currently coning. Yeah. <laughs> so here we go. Ta -da. It's so crazy. They look uh. almost like a glaucous blue. Yeah, yeah. And so apparently, um, you know, and I'm not really that familiar with it, but people talk about the Angolian po Angolan populations and the um, Namibian? Namibian populations. And apparently the ones from Angola grow a little bit faster. Interesting. Their cones are a little bit different. And so this might be the Angolan. 
because that one over there didn't have that blue in the cones that this one Very did. Very interesting. See, so, I, wasn't, I wasn't aware that I did know, like with uh, Cyphostema, Uter, you have the Namibian and the Angolan form, and one grows a little fatter and more stout, and the other one grows taller. And I bet you it's the Angolan one that goes taller because it's a little more music there, yeah. wetter. A, a, um, that, a, is that the northern form, Angolan? Uh -huh, yeah. yeah, okay, northern yes, Angolan. it is, yeah. So when I was there in, uh, back in 2008 uh, to see these in the wild, and it was really funny because I got a, uh, I got a, um, a GPS coordinates from somebody to find uh, the, some outside of this town called Korihas, yeah. uh, which is inland in an area where there's uh, acacia forests. The, the ones that I saw were like really meager. They'd been like eaten by goats, etc. And then we're driving on this road out to the coast uh, towards where, where, where the area where the big, really big Wawichias right. are. On the road there, just outside of where I was looking at these plants, we were driving along and like, I'm seeing aloe claviflora and like a bunch of like hundreds of little plants of a witchia. Wow. And I regret not stopping to photograph them. Yeah. Because these plants were like, they were growing from seed. There was tons of them. Unlike the ones that are out um, in that area where, you know, it doesn't rain right, right. along the coast. Right. So, so it, was, it was kind of fun to see I've that. seen a, in Phoenix, Arizona, in Arizona cactus sales, They've got one in the ground there, and they told me that it's in uh, two feet of decomposed granite, and that's it. They said they put it in when it was had a wingspan of about 24 inches, so about a uh -huh. foot long each leaf. Yeah, and it's been there for four years, and it's about that size. Oh yeah, it's These, it's pretty spectacular. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, very very cool. I'd like to get one in the ground myself. Yeah, I might be able right. To and see, we, we can't do that. We can't even put them outside here because it's Northern California. How often do you water the well witches? Good question. Because they're not a succulent. Uh, no, they're not. They're a, they're a phreatophyte. They're a plant that makes a, under, a taproot that goes way deep underground. You don't need to grow them in the tubes like this. This is the classic way of doing it, but they don't really need it. But they have this long taproot to get water. And so I water them two to three times a week. OK. okay? okay. And, and, and so when you say you water them, misting, over No, water, no, I, I slow them. I go in. These are in pure gravel. OK. Uh, I think this one over here is in pumice. Gotcha. And I just go in there and just flood the pot so to make sure water comes out of the bottom. Okay. And just give them a really good soaking. Uh, in fact, the last time I watered this week was on Tuesday, and they really need water. So I'm gonna as soon as we're done today, I'm gonna come in here and water all the leafy desert plants. Wells Witchy was the first plant in my collection that made me stop and treat it different from a cactus because i was like if i have to i treat everything like a cactus if it can't live like a cactus then it's not going to make it here uh -huh. and then so i started looking like at my well witch and i'm like oh that's not looking too good somebody's like you need to water that thing like okay. twice two three times okay. a week and yeah. i'm in i'm in los angeles where it's hot oh yeah so, so it's hot and dry it. so i water them like i water them probably every three days yeah, yeah. there yeah. you go yeah. yeah when we um uh in the summertime i i have to water them uh yeah every three days like and and the the days. like desiccated leaf tips that's normal at the end of the leaf, but if you start seeing that creeping towards the center, and what do you call this here? Um, the, I don't know, you could call it the codex, the, okay. the head, the, the stem, it's really like this modified, modified. you know all those plants that are crested? Yeah. Well, Wichia is the only plant that I know of that is genetically permanently that way. Right. With so many different types of plants that they have here at the conservatory, it almost felt difficult for us to stay focused on one particular thing. But once we finished up in the desert room, we went to go check out all of the carnivorous plants. Let's go check out these carnivorous plants. Do you have any people that grow carnivorous plants that are vegan? Uh, <laughs> That's a really good question. I was thinking about that when I was looking at these. I was like, I wonder what vegans would have to say. Not that, uh, you know, no judgment or anything. I guess, I guess you'd have to be kind of an insectivore, huh? Like insectivore. You'd, be, you'd be okay with e eating insects, right? That would technically fall into a paleo diet. I right, yeah. Some, some grub worms <laughs> and things like that. Yeah, so, um, you know, we've, we've had these plants for a while. And luckily, you know, uh, there's always been a group of people that are really into carnivorous plants. Uh, I am no carnivorous plants expert. I, I call myself a Jose of all plants, master of none. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Um, and, but but I you know watched what 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 our, our volunteers and student employees etc have done over the years. And right now we have two student employees. Uh, one of them has actually done some lectures on carnivorous plants. He's a little bit older student, and he worked at uh, Santa Barbara Orchid Estates. Okay. And so he's he's been working on the on the plants, and they show his work as well as the other student that's been working here. Um, so, uh, um, you know, just growing them, cleaning up, um, 
We, we take cuttings, uh, you can take stem cuttings of these things. Uh, they're, they're an epiphyte, and like I could take like this tip of this uh, Nepenthes ventricosa here and cut it off and put it in sphagnum moss and it would root. So uh, by epiphyte, you mean it grows on other yeah, plants? Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And you know, what, there's also lithophytes and there's things that grow like on the, on the surface of the soil in the rainforest and they climb, and then they climb up and they root in other places. Sure. And so, you know, the clambering, these are clambering plants. Gotcha. Oh yeah, these are all Southeast Asian. They're, you know, they, they, they bleed over into Australia and, and the adjacent islands in that area. Okay. But they're centered around Southeast Asia. Beautiful. Um, yeah, very tropical. And so they, so they, they, a little side note, okay? They um, are from Southeast Asia, and then I don't have my pictures here. So we have we have these American pitcher plants, okay. the Saracenias. Interesting. And uh, I always joke when I do tours to the students. <gasps> are you my doppelganger? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so where in the U.S. do these grow? Uh, Eastern United States. Okay. I, uh, Leucophila, I think, makes it down into Florida. Interesting. Um, okay. Georgia, Florida. Um, yeah, so they're, uh, these guys are from the Eastern United States, Southeast Asia. These are tropical plants that are low light tolerant. Gotcha. These are forest plants where there are no trees because it's so, uh, it's not a forest actually, they're um, a grassland. I grassland noticed you had species. some of these growing on a bench outside. And they do much better outside. These make terrible houseplants because they're adapted to really high light. Interesting. You know, like, Interesting. and you know, we were talking about succulents earlier. Um, I, I, it's, it's painful for me to watch all these people trying to grow succulents indoors <laughs> yeah. because succulents are highlight plants just like this that are made for areas where there are abundant amounts of light and then you grow them indoors where there aren't enough and they don't have a lot of surface area. They don't do very well soaking up sunlight when there's no, no light. So they suffer, okay? So these guys also make terrible houseplants. So to those people that I've suggested to get a, a heat pad and a grow light for your window oh, seal, yeah. Please listen to me. Please don't listen to me. Listen to Ernesto. He's hey, a plant scientist. Listen to both of us, okay? Yeah. You know, it's your plants idea. more light, more delightful plants. Yes, absolutely. Okay? Yeah. Like and the LEDs are, you know, are, are quite affordable these days. Uh, these are professional quality ones, but I was gonna you say they're them. blinding to look at. They're, they're really they're, bright. The yeah. light is quite beautiful. Oh it's my gosh. We've really got good. these other our other lights used to be noisy and you know, I've and they're like T5, big spotlights. Like a big you know, fluorescent oh, yeah. bulb, uh -huh. six lamps. Does the trick for propagation oh, yeah. in the yeah. garage for mm -hmm. now. Yeah. So oh, they're great. Now, do you feed these? I beg your pardon? Feed me. Uh, I can't. I'm starving. Uh, yes and no. Uh, the Saracenias, uh, we have them outside okay. and uh, sorry, I have an old one here. Oh wow! Um, uh, and so this is this is this has been feeding itself. Shoot, get a close shot outside. of that. Look at that. There's like, it's it's like cutting open jaws of stomach and finding oh. license plates. But to be reasonable, huh? This is not the time or the place to perform some kind of a half-assed autopsy on a fish. You know, what I tell people this is a this is CSI Entomology 2021 <laughs> Summer Edition. <laughs> Okay. Perfect. Um, and so, so, so these guys, we, we, they feed themselves outside. Okay. Okay. They actually don't do well in the greenhouse, even when we have them here under pretty high light. The Nepenthes, here and there. Oh, this one actually. I'm gonna rip it open so you can see the inside here. Okay. Because it actually has a little. It caught a little some ants inside of there. Oh wow. Okay. The ants went marching in. That is rad. Okay. And so. We were wondering when we were looking at these, inside of them, this isn't just water, is it? Well, uh, it is, but let's see if I can find one here. Okay. okay that's just liquidy. Here we go. I think this is the one. Check this out. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, check it, check it out. Oh, yeah. Okay, so okay. it's very... Uh, it's viscous liquid, you yeah. know. It's here it's a little diluted because we're, we're spraying water, water in there, above. so it gets diluted. But sometimes it's quite syrupy and, uh, you know, high viscosity fluid. Right. <laughs> so that's slow what down they, the they, they go in there and it's sweet, if I'm not they, mistaken. They right? make nectar on the inside right here uh, and, and around the rim here. And so the insects are, are lapping it up and, you know, uh, they, they, it's like a child playing. They forget about what's going on right. and then they fall inside of there and gotcha. then they get caught in that viscous liquid or just the water in there. They drown, they, and they get digested and broken down one way or the other. Amazing. So, and going back to your question about feeding them, here we don't get a lot of bugs moving into these except sporadically. Okay. 
And so um, what we do is we, we drop slow-release nutrient pellets inside of them every once in a while. Into the actual, what is this yeah. called, a tube? Uh, a, a pitcher. Pitcher, pitcher into pitcher, the pitcher, yeah. pitcher. okay. Yeah. And then yeah, that gives them. Me. I'm a cactus and succulent guy. There mostly, you go. So it's like, I'm fascinated, but I, it's new to me. What's cool how on our succulents, our, the modified part is oftentimes a stem. Right. On these guys, it's always a leaf. Because you know if a plant could talk to an insect, what it would say to it? No. Leave me alone. <laughs> hey, by the way, they, people, they do act like flowers a little bit. And so um, go ahead and touch that and then taste it. You know, you got to remove your mask for just a quick second there. Oh, you got to taste this. Oh, yeah. Pretty sweet, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Interesting. So they make they, they make their nectar. Like this one makes it all the way around on the outside to really lure the insects inside of there. And the, the look of them, is that, does that have any evolutionary purpose for the plant? Uh, yes. Because um, they, 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 so some of the red colors sort of remind me of some of the looks of a stapeliad flower, or some of the wormian flowers, go. things like that. They're acting like flowers. Uh, I, I heard of an entomologist one time say that, these are not acting like flowers. Well, everybody else looks at this and says, that looks like a flower to me. <laughs> I mean, it does look and, like some sort of and, a flower-esque yeah. uh -huh. and that's piece what they're of a doing. plant, for sure, yeah. They're leaves that have been selected through evolutionary time to act a little bit like flowers that attract insects, but these are catch and digest, not like flowers that are catch and release. Gotcha, You know okay. what I'm saying? Yeah. Like yeah. even the stapeliads, might, the, 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 the insect legs might get hooked into the flower there a little bit, but eventually, most of the times, the insects get freed and then they fly away and take pollen to another flower. Right, exactly. There's but this certain, yeah. is to catch them and get, you know, keep them there. Yeah, because I've seen uh, flowers where it literally traps the bee in there and it has to travel through a part of the flower to come out the other end and has pollen on it. Ta-da! <laughs> there you go. Okay. So, and this is called? This is um, one of the, uh, oh my God, Phragmopediums, or I think it's actually a Papiopetalum, excuse me. Uh, one of the orchids from Southeast Asia. Okay, I was going to say, because it looks like an orchid, yeah. Yeah, and look. Is there not a similarity floating around right there? It must uh, be a, a design that works, huh? Yeah, there you must go. Must be a design that works. There you go, yeah. That's so the insects are caught in there, and they have to climb out the backside, and they pick up and drop off pollen. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. So the insects uh, go inside of there, they fall inside of there, and then they, as they, they walk out the backside, on either side, you'll see a stamen sticking out, the male part sticking out the sides. Right. And the insects would first w rub up against the female parts and then rub up against the male parts on their way out. So they, they have to go in there, and that's why those two like petals or whatever you would want to call them, those two portions are kind of blocking them from getting out, and then they pop out of these little holes right here? Uh-huh, on the and sides. Then, okay, yeah. and this is the male portion of the flower? No, no, the males are, are, are just inside of there, behind this. Just inside yeah, of there, gotcha. behind, Right behind there, there's like a couple of them like pointing sideways. That's yeah. very cool. Have you been able to uh, propagate this particular plant? Um, you know, we just propagate these from offsets. Okay, so it does offset. Yeah, That's really these cool. guys. You know, I was talking to a friend, um, uh -huh. and he, I told him I was coming here, and he says, oh, will you do me a favor, and will you take photos of the female Amborella flower? Oh, all right. I, that's a pretty interesting flower. Let's go under my Amborella. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. Let's crack this way, yeah. Woo! All right, and she is an, in full and glorious bloom. Oh, Joey, you're in luck, dude. <laughs> I, they, they were wrong when they told me it wasn't flowering. Look at that. Oh, so, Joey, the uh, Joey from uh, um, Crime Pays but Crime Pays Bonnie doesn't? doesn't. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was here in the summertime, so he didn't see it blooming. So there you go. Yeah. It's it's the most ancestral of all the flowering plants. Most the most basal, excuse me, been shown to just be at the bottom of the, of the whole lineage. Um, so one of the first, essentially. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. these are found uh, on an island. Uh, Australia. New Caledonia. New Caledonia. Island of New Caledonia. And what's happened is that there's a few of these islands around the world that have never been glaciated, never had, had major geologic events. And so they, they basically uh, have that, the, you know, the earliest history of plants in the world because they like, you know, California, we have fossils of cycads here. Right. And ginkgo used to be on this continent. I've heard that there are fossils of Wells Wichia found in Brazil. There you go. Um, here's more carnivorous plants here. This is the, these are the, um, the ones from the uh, cool, cool climate adapted ones. Okay. Uh, um, and these guys are actually really cool. Uh, these are known as um, 
uh, Heliamboras yep. from this really amazing area called the Tapui in uh, Venezuela. The Tapui? Tapui, the Tapui. Oh, that's awesome. These are they. These that are is really cool. That's a place, right. man, that I would love and, building. And by the way, this is actually, these are related to Saracenias. Yeah, I, we, there's a, I love, the Tapuis are so cool. That's oh, what they modeled man. the whole scene, the whole uh, set for that movie Up. Oh, movie. that's what it was. Yeah, okay. it's all mod mod based on the Tapuis okay. and stuff. So check it out. I want to show you how these work because if we get up close here, um, they fill up with water because this area get, gets a lot of rainfall. Yeah. Okay. And then see how they slowly yeah. drain out. Can we do that one more time? Your cactus and succulent soil mix should drain a little faster than that, just so you guys know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. See how they, they're, it's draining out? They have, um because they get so much rainfall, they have a little drain hole so that they don't stay flooded with water, so that they have, a, you know, this area up here where the insects are going to fall inside right. of there and get caught. That's awesome. So which greenhouse are we in right now? Um, this is the conservatory. Okay. This is the the, the, the conservatory. Our, this is our primary display greenhouse. Gotcha. Um, and we have you know we have a little bit of everything in here because we wanted students students to come in here and and get sort of inundated with biodiversity. Okay. Very cool. Um, yeah. So this is our, our our sort of public display area. This is yeah. Fantastic. You got this is kind of a dream job I think for you, man. Hey, you know it's really it's really fun place to be because one again I get to deal with all sorts of plants. Uh, and I get to share them with people, uh, and it's for educational purposes. Uh, uh, it's not monetized, you know, and yeah. so I, I don't have to be thinking about the you bottom can really line. Focus on the pure science of it. Right? There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but again, we like to share plants, so we do propagate and, and sell stuff. I, I call our plant sales the green for green. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's good that people want them, and they do. Ha you can sell them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because then you, then it gets to fund these kind of projects. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I started back in the summer of 1991, so what, 30 years ago? Yeah. Going on 30 years, and which is weird because you look like you're like 30. So <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I don't understand. The mask helps. The, the growing, <laughs> cultivating plants keeps you young, huh? There you go. Yeah, being in the greenhouse most of the time. I hear you're yeah. you're kind of you're like a, a hippie too. I saw pictures of you with you had hair like I used mine to have long hair. Day. Yeah, I used to look more like a little witchy of plants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Hey, Melody. Okay, let's go on in here. So. Um, we, we have a, we've had a really hard time over the years having like areas dedicated for propagation and sales because right. that's not our primary mission. Sure. But uh, this space right here has been one of our sort of uh, our, our propagation areas, uh, where we have almost everything in here is for our plant sales. Gotcha. Um, and uh, so um, you know you you you're asking me to talk about propagation. Well, we do it kind of seasonally for the most part. Um, so, uh, you know, as things are growing, we're, you know, propagating them. Um, but here, you know, here and there things can, we can do them year round. You know, you know this one? Yep. Oh, yeah. I sure do. Yeah. You filled the curry. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we, 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 we uh, transplanted our plants not too long ago and they had nice pulses of growth. And so we made some offsets for, for propagation. Nice. Yeah. And you have um, to cut those around kind of the base of the stem. You cut right them where right where the up. connection point is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, they just do much better that way than just a, a straight cut across gotcha. where there's minimal damage. I'm rooting one right now. Okay. Actually, yeah. I'm rooting two. I've, I was recently given two oh, uh, nice pieces. Great. Like, Here you go. Knock yeah. yourself out. I'm All, right. Like, All right. It just takes a while. And you know what What happened? What? Um, you know how I was telling you about how I watered my Wawichia yeah. uh, more? Well, in our desert room, we had a lot of these like sem uh, semi-leafy succulents like the Dendrosicchios and, and some other things that we, my predecessor kind of underwatered them. Sure. And so I realized that I could water them more. Right. Well, I made a little, a few mistakes where I took it a little too far and our Euphorbia albicurries were one of them where I, they're, they're a, probably an a, a obligate cam plant where they always shut down during the day. Yeah. And I overwatered them, I rotted their roots out and so I had them for several years as just cut stems. And then we finally got them into pumice and they started rooting, they're growing. So let's go over here, I'll show you the abdul curries that I almost killed. 
again, when you know I rotted the roots out, when we got them into the into pure pumice, they started rooting. Those roots made cytokinin, and that promoted a bunch of branching up here. So you can see, like, look at this one, how it's multi multi headed. Yeah. So um, you've got a lot of auxins going on here, being pushed down to the roots. Yeah, Is that yeah, correct? yeah. Right there, you go. Uh huh. That's right. Yeah. So, so you you know they were they were up here. They didn't have much roots on them. Well, the the, the tips generate some auxin that travels down, promotes root growth. Once the roots are growing really well, they send up cytokinin up, and that promotes vegetative growth up here, and you get this positive feedback. That's growth. awesome. So if you ever have a plant that is kind of shut down and it's not growing very much, um, it, during the growing season, if you trim it back, you should create a hormone imbalance that will cause growth and will kind of wake it up. So um, one of the other, one of my other, you know, Dorstenias are one of my ever favorite plants. We're, we're sort of known as one of the major uh, propagators of dendrocycles like we talked about. Right. And then Dorstenia gigas. Yes. Um, and I, I'm not propagating too much of them right now, but I'll show you a few. But uh, um, we've had this uh, clone of, of Taba Gorge, Dorstenia, uh, I think it's in the Fedida group, uh, Taba Gorge. Yeah. And uh, it's a really nice one that crests. Yeah, uh, here's, yeah, there you go. Look at this one right here. We've had this amazing success growing stuff in, in big pots with pure pumice because it's really hard to overwater a sure. plant when it's pure pumice. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's how you can get them, you know, more drainage, bigger pot because what do roots love? Oxygen. Yes. Okay. So I do, I'm running an experiment on three pseudolithos that I have. One is in my mix. One is in uh, a C and J's mix which is heavy organic, organic right? heavy yeah. peat moss and perlite, and then one in pure pumice. And I am uh, horrified to report that the one growing the best is the one in CNJ's really crummy mix. But apparently, maybe for growing a seedling, it's not so crummy. It's Actually, kind of you, know what, you know what I found out with pseudo, I had a pseudolithos that was like this big with multi heads on yeah. there, and I was watering it three times a week in pure pumice. These are some in here, some of our pseudolithos. Yeah. And I water them about three times a week. Really? And they're much happier. Wait, when so I do thorough, that. thorough watering till it's draining out of the bottom? Yeah. Yeah. And actually, you know what? A heavy watering once a week? Good, 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 really good question. Good, good point. Uh, not like with witch here where I water them every time heavy watering. Right. These ones, what I'll do is I'll do a heavy watering and then I'll water them, uh, uh, I'll do a light watering in between. Okay, gotcha. So one heavy watering like about once a week and then about three or four days later, a little splash. So I, one other question about watering succulents. There is a lot of misinformation going around on the internet. And one of the things that you hear often is that you can't water your cactus and succulents. You don't want to get the actual plant wet. You have to dunk the entire, they expect you to take every single one of these and put it into a bucket and bottom water it. Uh, incorrecto. Okay. <laughs> what, so, okay. so can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Um, can you dispel that myth that's going uh, around? Hey. Plants that are out there in the wild, they get watered from above all the time, man. <laughs> uh, you know, the best thing to do, I mean, listen, you don't want to water them in the evenings on a very warm day uh, or, or, or on a cool day when they're, when they're gonna, that water's gonna sit and promote fungal and bacterial activity. Right. So what do you do? The best thing is you water them in the morning from the sides and it, like, I, I have a bunch, all these in here, I just spray them from above. These, uh, astrophytum in here, I water them in the morning. Yeah. I water them from above, wash off dust off of them and let the water run down the stem and, and we're good to go. And the water um, flushing through the pot actually flushes out all of the salt yeah, buildup that you get. Exactly, yeah. Just water from above, let it drain out and then have them elevated. If you have them in a tray, have them elevated so that that's, if your water has mineral rich, it flushes out and doesn't get sucked back into the right, plant. Right, right. So okay. that's why all the benches cool. are open air and open, you have yeah. plenty of ventilation mm -hmm. so everything can drain out and there drip down. There you go. Okay, yeah. awesome. Uh -huh. Yeah. I appreciate you clearing cool. that up for us. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's, awesome. go on, let's go on into the main room and just uh, into the main room of this greenhouse and, and look at a couple things. Right so now. you asked about Dorstenia gigas. Here's some of our little baby Dorstenias. Okay. Uh, these guys actually can be propagated from cuttings. Okay. And I'll show you an individual that I'm working on trying to figure out how to propagate it vegetatively better because I think it's a really nice clone. Uh, so I'm gonna try to get it out there, but these are grown from seed and then, you know, anyways, you got a nice little plant right there. Yeah, I have one, I have two gigas. One was seed grown and one is a cutting and the seed grown one is different looking right now, but I yeah. feel like over time, you're not really gonna be Over able to time, you, do, you can't tell. There's, there's, there's stories out there, but obviously like when you, in, in, people haven't had a lot of seedlings for a long time right. and, and they thought the plant looked one way, but um, there's a lot of genetic diversity in them. That in the, 
Okay. Well, and then here you go. Look at this is a uh, Dorstenia alley right here. Okay. Um, this right here is is an individual known as the UCLA clone. Okay. This one actually makes. Uh, this is a functioning a female plant. Okay. Okay. Um, over here, this is what we call the UC Davis clone, and uh, you know they're they're per fairly different looking plants. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they're leaf shape, length, width. The texture of the leaf, etc. Right. Almost even kind of the texture of the uh, stem a little bit. Yeah, too. a little bit, right? Yeah. So when you when you cross these two, um, you get a lot of genetic diversity, F1 diversity. Right. And so um, I've got had quite an assortment of seedlings come out of these. Um, uh, this is an old. I think that this. I'm, I can't. <laughs> I have to, I'd love to do some genetic testing. I'm pretty sure that this is actually a cutting of this guy over okay. here. Okay. And look how huge it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I want to bring you over here and show you. This is my. Uh, we're a little, little tight back here, but. Um, you know, it's a little. It's growing a little bit uh, uh, with a lot of water right now, so the leaves are kind of expanded. But I like the darkness of the leaves on this plant. Well, and they um, seem like. Uh, so like little pustules on them yeah almost, yeah you know? very textured right yeah, yeah really really textured um and yeah i so i i anyways this is i i'm i'm i, I want to give this a clonal name something associated with like clouds in socatra okay that'd be cool um so uh, is yeah. this is this a oh a little temperature sensor temperature thing? yeah let's see if i can if it's hooked in here so that's reading humidity and temperature and yeah. okay yeah these things are kind of cool they oh this is a d1 so this only does temperature but there's another one that has the d2 that has a little humidity sensor also yeah and uh i love having these in the greenhouse because we don't have as an old greenhouse from the 60s uh 50, no, early late 50s yeah so about 60 years old and uh it doesn't have any tracking so i, I got these things to, to keep track okay um, very cool temperature and humidity more cactus over here huh yeah yeah, a lot of this is yeah, this is, we're sort of becoming our cactus bench right in here. Cool. Uh, we've been doing some grafting. Uh, um, check this. This is a graft that was done a long time ago, of a strombo cactus on a pereskia. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. This is a stichium. What am I saying? A stichium. Oh, yeah. Our stichium uh, um, uh, hintonii. This is our clone. What we call our clone C. Uh, I, yeah, I, I'm just, I was thinking of a, a strombo cactus because we have a really old one that's really branched. And we recently recently cut off some of the heads oh, yeah. to graft them. Um, yeah, yeah. Gianluca has been doing a lot of uh, a lot of propagation. I, I credit him with with a lot of the recent propagation that we've been doing. So, so here we'll just we'll just finish up here. Um, you know, some of the other things that we've been doing uh, is we uh, a while ago I got some seeds of this Caroluma acutangula. And so we've been propagating this uh, uh, more sort of tropical um, uh, Southern Africa. Yeah. Um, so is it getting ready to flower? This is this is a flower head. So this will re re bloom okay. again. These heads, they have they sort of have this area where they, um, where they just keep blooming from, um, and then that's a you know a new branch growing out of there. So yeah, this this is a blooming size cutting now because it's very yeah, cool. We took a bunch of tips. I'm growing a yeah. couple different types of Caroluma, uh, Socotrana and oh, okay, yeah, the Socotrana is so hard. We, I, I killed so many of those plants, uh, and I think it's just the right temperatures for it. I think they like it hot and low humidity, and oftentimes we have, when we have hot, we have high humidity, so it's a little challenging. Oh, they yeah. should like it in my greenhouse. Yeah. When um, it's hot, it's like 10%. <laughs> or, okay. Oh, good, good, yeah. Sometimes. So hey, uh, final thoughts here, okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, I won't steal that line from you know what's her face, <laughs> but anyways. The great you know, the the, like the, uh, the mature artist steals the immature artist <laughs> there imitates. You. So <laughs> take it, baby. I like that immature artist. I like I think, that. Yeah. I forget who said that, but that's a famous quote. <laughs>
and I learned from them. But he was, you know, trying to tell me very gently, upright. That everybody says, knows that they grow much better upright. And I was like, oh. And then I learned. And I just was like, okay, you're right. And it makes sense. Oxen travels down, builds up, better rooting. Interesting. Yeah. Very cool. Well, Ernesto, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to show welcome. Kevin and I around here and to show everybody at home watching and around the world. Uh, it's fascinating and I really, really appreciate it. I know it's difficult for you to do it and cool. I super appreciate the yeah, time. Yeah, glad it worked today. out. We did it. Yeah.